14 is where we're going to be. We're going to finish this, this chapter this morning. Uh, in case you guys didn't know, uh, Valentine's Day, you know, uh, just to keep it real with you is, uh, you know, St. Valentine is the patron saint of love, but he's also the patron saint of ep 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 epilepsy and beekeeping. So I'm just going to put that out there. I don't know what that means, but he's the patron saint of love, epilepsy, and beekeeping. So keep that. I know it's quite the combo. I don't know how it all works together, but there you go. So Luke 14 is where we're going to be. So I don't know. You probably heard the, the phrase bait and switch before, bait and switch. I remember being a, a freshman at Arizona State University, go Sun Devils. Um, so I was at the university, and I remember seeing all these really cool uh, sweatshirts. Jared, you want to you wanna show off your, your sweatshirt? It was kind of like that. It may have been a little cooler, but that's a cool sweatshirt, so thank you for wearing it. But uh, I remember seeing these sweatshirts, and then I remember being approached by, by someone saying, hey, you want a free Arizona State University sweatshirt? And I was like, of course I do, right? I'm a, I'm a, n a newly married young student at, uh, at ASU, and I'm like, I can't afford one, but I would love a free one, right? And I remember they were, they were getting people walking down Palm Lane and all this, and they're, come, come back to the, to the MU, the student, you know, ministry, the student uh, building area. And so we went back, and, and I remember going, okay, where's the free sweatshirt? And they basically wanted to sign my life away on a credit card at that point. And I just totally felt like jilted at that moment. Has anyone ever been there, right? Like you're lured in with something and then they sit there and go, oh, if you want this, you've got to basically give us your right arm, you know? And, and you're like, man, this stinks, right? It, it goes back even further than that, junior high. Unrequited love. Can anyone, can anyone identify with unrequited love? So I remember this, this girl in junior high camp uh, that I heard liked me. Now, at that point, I don't know how to respond, how to act, what to do, right? And um, so I remember, instead of me being the initiator at that point, she was the one that initiated a conversation with me. And, of course, I got all, like, clammy and nervous. And, and I heard that she liked me, and I thought, cool, my first girlfriend, seventh grade, woohoo! Only to find out that she was really after my best friend, and she was using me. Bait, bait and switch. And I'll tell you what, foreigner, I want to know what love is, never felt so real. <laughs> then, then at that moment, I want to know what love is. And I was just pleading. I mean, this was before Jesus, BC, before Christ. I want to know what love is, broken heart. I, Delilah, pillow talk radio, beca became <laughs> early counselor, early, earliest counselor I can remember in my life. How I would cry myself to sleep to... Madonna's crazy for you, and uh, foreigners, I want to know what love is. So bait and switch. We, we don't like to be led on to believe in something that, that is masqueraded or, or advertised as something false. And um, there's something remarkable and unique about Jesus that he never pulls a bait and switch on us. Um, if you look at the life of Jesus, he never promises you something and then says, surprise, it's going to be something different. He's always upfront about what is expected. If you want to love him, if you want to, to follow him, Jesus never plays a bait and switch, which is probably why more people rejected him than responded to him. See, we have to think about this. When you look at the, the life and ministry of Jesus, he's very upfront about what it means to follow him or be his disciple. We come to Luke 14, and, and this is a tough section. It would be easy for, for most uh, pastors or speakers to say, hey, we're going through Luke, we're just going to skip over this part. But, but I wouldn't do you any service, I wouldn't do you any good if, if I just glossed over it or passed over it or, or maybe cheapened it a bit. And I, and I think that word is important, cheap. Here's what I know is that salvation is costly. And the life that comes as a result of salvation is not a cheap life. It is a gift. Matter of fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship where he coined the phrase cheap grace. And one thing we should never ever conclude and something that as you walk with Jesus becomes a reality is you understand what God demands of you is, is, is never something to be treated trivially or cheaply. 
See, we have to, we have to understand that when it comes to what, what Christ teaches and what he expects, there's a difference between conversion and consecration. Matter of fact, write those two words down in your notes. Conversion and consecration. See, conversion is, is coming to Christ and trusting Christ because he offers us what we can never ever gain ourselves or achieve ourselves. That's conversion, but consecration, or I may use the word discipleship because we're going to talk about that. Consecration is this life that is now set apart, saying, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. But what that means is now carrying your cross. See, Jesus in salvation bore the cross for us. Consecration means I now carry a cross. And I must follow him. See, salvation is trusting, discipleship is following. And we have to understand that just because salvation's free doesn't now mean it's cheap. We understand the value of salvation the more we follow Jesus. The person that treats salvation cheaply is a person that's not following Christ. And let me just tell you, I'm going to be up front. Coming to Jesus is the easy part. Yeah. Following Jesus is the hard part. And Jesus is very upfront about this. I mean, he wants you to be his disciple. It's not like he's, he, he's, he's, re he's rejecting you and he doesn't want, but he's, he's upfront about the demands. The word disciple alone, which means a follower, a, a learner, someone who is, who is constantly under the teaching and influence, is used in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Acts 264 times. This is an important word, that word disciple, which we use the word discipleship in the context of Missio Dei because this is what we believe God's called us to, to make more and better disciples. So what does it mean to live for Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? Three things we're going to look at this morning. One is kind of a, a, a negative point, and then the final two will be positive points. But let's look at the passage, and we'll go back and we'll tease this out a bit. So Luke 14, starting at verse 25 now great multitudes were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who uh, observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he has a strong enough army with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000 men? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt becomes tasteless, with what will it become seasoned again? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So first thing we have to notice, and we can't just pass by it, verse 25. Look at it. Great cloud, crowds are following him, and he turns and he speaks these words to them. Jesus here deliberately is going to reduce disciples, quote-unquote disciples, right? A crowd is not necessarily a church. Let me say it again. A crowd is not necessarily a church. Jesus is not a salesman. I mean, you're sitting there going, Jesus, these are not really inviting words if you're building your kingdom. Right? He's not the, the, the kind of guy who's trying to get people to commit to a, a set of benefits, a, a, a host of experiences. You know, what's it going to take for me to get, into, in, to get you into this religion? What's it, am I, do I need to drop the price? Do I need to throw some more amenities in? What do I need to do to get you in this religion? That's, that's not Jesus. He, he's not a salesman. He's not, he's not after quantity. He's after quality. 
See, we can all gather a crowd. But that's not what God's into. He's not into numbers. He is into hearts. Because the number of people doesn't reflect the number of hearts that adore him. And this is what God's after. He wants you to love him for who he is. He wants you to love him for what he's done. He doesn't want you to love him for what he can offer you. I mean, you, the great crowds were following him. Why? Because he is an enigmatic figure. He's gathering lots of excitement because people love looking, they love listening, and occasionally getting a free meal. Who wouldn't want, like, have you tried his wine? It is off the charts. Oh, and that fish and bread combo? Woo, exquisite. See, if Jesus were here today, he'd, you know, we, we think he'd be this hugely successful megachurch pastor by today's standards. I'm sure if Jesus were here on Instagram, he would have a million followers. They would call him an influencer. He would have billions of views on his YouTube channel. But Jesus isn't interested in that. Isn't it funny that we celebrate all those things and think they matter? See, Jesus isn't into that. He's interested in real disciples. He's interested in people who he can move from just being curious to being committed. And so he <laughs> deliberately reduces. It's like he's intentionally trying to scare them away. I remember first time I ever went skydiving. I should say first time and last time I ever went skydiving. Uh, was, we, we had little kids at the time. We had a guy in our church, and he said, it was your birthday. I want to take you skydiving. I'm sitting there going, yes, right, get to go sky, skydiving. I remember for the first hour of arriving at the skydiving area, they tried to talk you out of skydiving. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, I don't know. They're playing you these videos. It's kind of like when, in, when you're in high school and you're watching all the, the driver's ed stuff, red asphalt. You remember the day of, of seeing all that. It's like, here's what could happen to skydiving, and here's all the best. And an hour, and you're sitting there going, and people literally are getting up and walking out. I'm like, how do you sell skydiving packages when you're trying to scare everyone out of it? Because they want you to understand, this is not something you play games at. This is, this is something, you're going up 14,000 feet, and you're going to jump out of an airplane, and you're going to pull a ripcord, and you're going to hope something pops out of it. And they're telling you, it may not happen. I'm going, I think my bones are pretty flexible. I can bounce pretty good. Especially if I got another guy doing tandem, right? I'll just get behind him. He'll cushion the blow, right? They're trying to scare you out of it. Why? Because he doesn't want you to approach it carelessly. He doesn't want, they don't want you to approach it as if, oh, it's just like riding a bike. No, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right? And so Jesus, he deliberately is, is scaring people off because here's what you have to understand. He's almost being an anti-evangelist. Have you ever thought of Jesus being the anti-evangelist? Joshua 24, write it down. This is bonus. We don't, have, we don't have a verse. This is just bonus. Joshua 24 was the first anti-evangelist in the Bible. And he goes to Israel and says, you guys, you guys don't want to worship God. He's like trying to steer them away. You guys don't want to worship God. And they're like, we do, we do, we do. He goes, no, you don't. He goes, because you, what you need to know is you, the God you, want, you say you want to worship, he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. And if you don't understand the character of our God, you're going to begin to worship him, and you're going to find that he is a lot more different than you thought he was, and you're going to turn from him. And if you even start to dabble and you turn, it is almost impossible to go back. That's why Hebrews says, you've tasted something, but you've tasted enough to know that there are certain demands that you cannot live up to, you reject and you turn away from it, good luck trying to even come back and restore some sort of desire and appetite. See, Jesus is very forthright. You need to know what it means to be my disciple. And so we come to two important points now that I want to really unpack with you. The first is this. Here are the demanding requirements. Right? I, 
I can look back in my life as a pastor, as, as someone who's worked in the church 30 years, and, and I, can, I can tell you there have been times when I've minimized the requirements. Because I felt like, whatever it means to get him in, whatever it means to get him in a seat, or to, and I've minimized what Jesus has demanded. And if I'm minimizing that for others, what does that look like in my own journey? I mean, is our God not a holy God? Is our God not a jealous God? Does he not want our hearts more than he wants anything else? And when our hearts want him more than anything else, is he not glorified in that? Yeah. So, so the demanding requirements are, are toward that end. That we realize that we want him more than we want anything else in this world. And when we realize that we can have him, that nothing else matters. Not saying nothing else is important, but he is the most important in our hearts. Look at these things here in verses 26, 27, verse 33. Three times Jesus thins the ranks and says, here are the exacting terms of what it means to follow me. He's unashamed in unpacking this. He's unafraid in unpacking this. He's, he's going to tell you what the worst is up front. Isn't that awesome? He's going to say, it's going to be a painful, painful thing to be a Christian. You're going to have to hate your family. You're going to have to carry a cross. You're going to have to renounce all your possessions. Who's in? I love Dallas Willard. Uh, he was a philosophy professor at uh, UCLA. He wrote some magnificent books on discipleship. Here's what Willard says. He says, it is costly to follow Jesus, but it's even more costly to engage in a life of non-discipleship. I'm going to tell you, if you reject what Jesus has to say, it's going to cost you more. It's going to cost you more. He's very forthright. Jesus is very forthright what it means to follow him. Kind of like what Ernest Shackleton, uh, one of the greatest adventure stories of all time, the endurance. These men set out to cross Antarctica. Here's the ad he put in the paper. Men wanted for hazardous journeys, small wages, bitter cold, long months of, of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Who wants to join up? <laughs> Next morning, there was a line of men around the block that went as far as the eye could see. Is that amazing? Like you would think, who would show up for this? There were men in England that said, I want that. Because when something speaks to the deepest part of who you are, and I can think of nothing deeper than your spiritual life before God, there's something that does actually respond. Right? There's a, there's a part of me as a 15-year-old that said, I'm, I, I, I think I understand, and, and for 35 plus years, I continue to understand. And I can honestly tell you that there's been no sacrifice in my life that I've made to honor Jesus that I've ever looked back and thought, yeah, it really wasn't worth it. So Jesus says, you want to be my disciple? And notice, it's, you're going to be his disciple. Everyone's a disciple of something and someone. You guys realize this, right? You're influenced by something or someone. My prayer is that you're influenced and discipled by Christ. So three times in this passage, Jesus announces the people who cannot be his disciple. You cannot be a disciple if you don't hate your family. You cannot be a disciple if you don't carry a cross. You can't be a disciple if you don't renounce all your possessions. So here's some startling, shocking statements. And here's why he's doing this. He's inspiring his followers to the highest level of devotion. I want that kind of person in my life that is going to say hard things because they want me to go higher, experience something greater. See, this is not about what God wants from you. This is about what God wants for you. Three things. Number one, there's a relational cost. Number two, there's a personal cost. And number three, there's a material cost. Number one, the relational cost. Jesus says, I must be loved above all others. Now you're sitting here going, what gives him the audacity to make a statement like that? Who does this guy think he is to demand such ultimate loyalty? Can I just stop you right there? He's God. 
This is deity. This is deity speaking. If you, if you think about it, this is really Exodus 20, verse 3, the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus is just putting it in a different language. Because you know who the gods tend to be? Our relationships. Wife, husband, kids, grandkids, animals, manatees, puppy dogs, you name it. We put other things in place of God and we are more loyal to those relationships than we are to him. And if there's anyone who demands absolute, undivided devotion and loyalty, it's God. And this is essentially what Jesus is saying. And he's saying it to a group of people. Now, now you have to remember this. He is saying this, and again, they're harsh words. Look at verse 26. You must hate your mother, father, wife, husband, sons, daughters, grandkids, neighbors. Maybe it's not hard. I hate your neighbors, but we'll, we'll talk about it another time. Here's the thing. This is not going against what Jesus has already said about honoring your father and mother. This is not going against what God has revealed in the scripture where you are to love your spouse. But he's saying those loves are a distant second to the ultimate love you have for God. Right? He, God doesn't contradict himself. Jesus doesn't go against other things he has said. He is saying that you must be ultimately loyal to him because I know the dangers that family puts upon you. Things that we sit there and go, I, I feel called by God, but my mom's saying this. I feel led by God, but my spouse is saying this. I'm gonna tell you right now that you're gonna be confronted with choices to offend your family or offend Jesus. You've gotta offend somebody. These are people, the Jewish people, they, because they were God's chosen people, they had this false sense of security. They had this false sense of, of status. They had this false sense of salvation because of the family they belonged to. Do you understand why this is? My kids, I, fe I fear for my own children. Why? Because they're pastor's kids. Being a pastor's kid doesn't get you into heaven. I wish there was a making a little ID, right? It's like, Addison, here he is. Pastor's kid, get a, get a hall pass, I'm in. No, no, no. You don't get into heaven by being a pastor's kid. You get in by loving Jesus more than you love anything else. You see, the danger of our families and our attachments, the danger that comes with this false sense of security and status and, and salvation, we're to love our enemies. We're not discounting that. We're to honor our father and mother. And so what we are saying, or what Jesus is saying paradoxically, is that we must love him, and that love for him must be so great and so pervasive that our natural love for family and for friends pales in comparison. Jesus is saying that in order to be his, his disciple, you must love him more than your own parents, your mate, your children, and your sisters and your brothers. There's a loyalty there that says nothing will deter me from pursuing him. Like I said, all other relationships are a distant second. He says it in a different way in Matthew chapter 10, and, and perhaps this will help make sense of it. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You see how he takes the hate part? Because we get all hung up on that. That's not speaking in tongues. I'm just making a sound like, no. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see what Jesus is saying? He must be the ultimate focus of a heart that adores and is devoted to stuff. That's where our, heart, our hearts are powerful, powerful things that God has given to us. And God knows the temptation we have to love and adore and be devoted things that are not God. And the greatest of those is our family, our relationship, right? There's gonna come times when you choose Jesus over your own family. No doubt. This is a high price for many. And you know what happens? They begin to leave. And notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say, oh, whoa, 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 come back, come back, come back. Okay, let me, let me reduce the demand. <laughs> I see I'm losing influence, I'm losing impact, I'm losing the crowd, right? Okay, uh, just hate your wife and your mother-in-law, and we're, we're good. He, here's, the, here's the crazy thing. Jesus doesn't reduce the demand. He now increases it. He sees people leaving and goes, 
All right, how can I thin the crowd even more? Um, Verse 27. Carry your cross. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So now there's not just a relational cost, now there's a personal cost. And, And you know what this means, this is hard. Take all your plans and all your desires and all your passions and all your goals and crucify them. Jesus isn't saying having plans and goals and, and desires is bad. But they, will, they, they now take a back seat to God's plans and purposes and desires. Because sometimes God's plans are not my plans. Sometimes God's desires are not my desires. And he is continually telling me, this is not about you, Scott, and your kingdom. This is about me and my kingdom. Your kingdom will come to nothing. My kingdom will reign forever. You want to continue to pursue your plans, just realize they're going to come to nothing. I don't want to, I don't want to end my life thinking that I was living my life for God when I was really living for myself. See, what the, the personal cost demands is that I do constant heart evaluation. I do a constant heart check and go, okay, what do I need to do for God, not what do I need to do for myself? And can I just tell you, let's be honest, every single day, each of us battles that. Is today going to be about God or is today going to be about me? Because these people, they, when they heard carry the cross, they see this every day in their community. They see m- people who are now convicted of a crime walking through their streets carrying the cross beam of a cross on their shoulders. And when they see that person, they're not sitting there going, well, I hope they're back by lunchtime. I, mama's making a mean matzo ball soup. They better be back for it by dinner. When they see a person carrying a cross, they realize that person's not coming back. They're probably mourning because that's a person in their community that, that they maybe got a chance to interact with, but they know that person is on a one-way path to die. And Jesus is not saying you carry his cross. He carried his cross for us, and that's a one-time deal. You can't even carry his cross. He had to do it. He's God, became our substitute, became our, 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 our savior, living a perfect life for imperfect people, amen? He carries his cross. But he now demands, because he lived a life of such self-denial, such self-sacrifice, he now says, now you're going to live a same kind of life. A self-denying life. I want you to write down a phrase. And the phrase is this. A series of deaths. Because what I continue to discover about when I, as I follow Christ is this. The Christian life is filled with a series of deaths. I wish I could tell you it was August 15th, 1985, and that was the only time I had to die. I've be, I won't say I've become an expert in dying. Because I don't think it's ever a class you graduate from. It's never a college you ever get a degree from. But you have to constantly realize that what Christ calls you to, and this, is, and this is Bonhoeffer's words in Cost of Discipleship, when Christ bids a man to come, he invites that man to come and die. Because here's what happens. As you die to yourself, the life of Christ grows within you. Where death happens, life is a result. And, and again, this is better caught than taught. Trust me. The more you die to yourself, the more that is the soil in which the life of Christ grows. Whew. I mean, Philippians 3. This is, Philippians 3 has been one of those passages for me. I think Philippians 2, Philippians 3, probably some of the most precious, yet some of the most painful. Where, where Paul says, whatever I gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've, counted suffered the, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not 
having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteous from God that depends on faith. He continues, that I may know him, right? For him, there is nothing worth sacrificing, right? There, everything was worth sacrificing for the fact of knowing him, the power of his resurrection, the sharing of his sufferings, become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the, re- attain the resurrection of the dead. This is why there's a reward for those when they sacrifice everything for Jesus, you'll stand before him and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. You understood the value of eternity. You understood the value of worshiping God wholeheartedly and and with utter devotion. See, there's a personal cost to, to us. Discipleship requires everything of us and everything from us. There's no one foot in, one foot out. Can I ask you, reflect with me on on a few questions I I put down, just because it is a constant battle, just like Jesus in the garden, right? Not your, not my will, but your will be done, Father. How how difficult is that to pray? Listen to these questions. Have I honestly and objectively taken my life's goals and desires before the Lord for his final approval? Do my goals and desires honor him rather than simply make me happy? Am I really willing to change them if he were to show me that I should? I mean, that's, that's the kind of heart examination that, that Jesus demands. Right? Because Jesus isn't your disciple. You're his disciple. And let's be honest, we, we confuse that, right? We keep God in our back pocket as if he's this manageable deity. We just pull him out like a genie and be like, hey, he's here to bless me. He's here to make me happy. No, he's not. You're here to worship him. Adore him. Be devoted to him. He's the potter. You're the clay. <laughs> but there's going to be this testimony throughout history that says, Nothing you'll ever sacrifice won't be rewarded to you. A hundredfold, ten thousandfold, right? Matthew chapter 19. Look at at the words of Jesus, right? He says in Matthew 19, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Amen, right? This is the the Matthew 13. Again, a phenomenal parable. We talked about it in men's group, 6 a.m. Friday mornings. If you guys want to show up, shameless plug, sorry. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man finds and covers up, and then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Notice the phrase, in his joy. You don't do, when you taste the goodness of God, you don't sell everything reluctantly. When you taste the goodness of God, you don't sell everything begrudgingly. When you taste the goodness of God, you are happy, you are joyful, and you can't wait to get rid of stuff. Because the kingdom is that good. Third point, material cost, right? Salvation's free, but it's going to cost you everything. Both can be true. Salvation is free, but it's going to cost you everything. Can I tell you something remarkable about the Christian life and following Jesus? It's not a matter of coming to God and telling him how much you have to offer. Discipleship is most richest when you come before God and renounce everything you have to offer. We think God is impressed with our talents and our skills and our possessions and our stuff. Let me just tell you right now, to be his disciple, you don't bring anything to him to prove your commitment or your worthiness. You leave it all behind so that only he gets the glory. He strips you down, man. He takes off the facade, the veneer, and says, now that you're naked and poor, now I can do something with you. You've got... Whereas Christianity is a series of deaths, it is also a series of renouncements. Everything that the world would parade and celebrate, God says, get rid of it. He's not saying, let's be clear, he's not saying you can't own anything. He's saying the problem happens when it begins to own you. Let's be honest. The stuff we buy the stuff we accumulate 
while we think so many times it can help us, a lot of it begins to be a hurdle, an obstacle from us serving God. Because what if God said to you today, I want you to go serve me overseas? And you're sitting there going, "Uh, but I've got my car payment, I've got my house payment, I've got my pool, and I've got the... You need to be able to say, I can get rid of it. I mean, I'll take it, if if that's what God's saying to you. (laughs) But if God said to you today, jump, you're sitting there bogged down with so much stuff, you can't even make a move an inch upward. When are you going to learn to release and be ready for God to say, do this? And you're going to do it. Could, could you renounce everything and, and follow him, right? Is, is the kingdom so valuable to you that you're willing to say, the kingdom is so valuable, I'm willing to sell everything I have? These are the demanding requirements of Christ. These are, these are the things that, that Jesus says you must continue to cultivate, you must focus on, right? The, the fact that he is to be our ultimate loyalty. The fact that he and his will is the ultimate thing I should pursue. The fact that none of my possessions mean anything in light of what the kingdom demands of my life. This is not easy. This is the walk of a disciple that learns. And, it, and you learn, and you learn, and you learn, and you don't give up learning. It's like Yasra Heifetz, a great violinist who devoted 100,000 hours to learn violin. It's like a guy named Da Vinci. You ever heard of him? Pretty good artist, I hear. It took him 1,000 pictures of a hand just to get it anatomically correct. Arnold Palmer hitting thousands of tee shots at the driving range. Michael Jordan throwing up thousands of shots during practice per day. Those people pursued something that they found interest in, that they loved to do, and they devoted their lives to it. And here's the thing that Christ is calling us to, and yet we hardly budge. Because we're still in that curious category, and we're not in the committed category. Why? Why is this so important? Last point. There are dynamic reasons for this. And, I, and we're going we're gonna to look at this next section, and we're going to probably begin to see it in a different way than maybe we thought it was really saying. What are the dy- dynamic reasons for it? Check this out. Jesus says, what kind of builder attempts to build a tower, doesn't realize he has enough resources, has to stop halfway through? What kind of king goes into battle with, a, with an army that's not prepared to take on the enemy? And what kind of salt loses its saltiness? Here's what God says, and here are the dynamic reasons of why he wants disciples, because in, in the end, it's about his kingdom. And here's how God builds his kingdom. You ready for this? He builds a church, he battles the enemy, and he betters the world. How many of us, looking at these illustrations that Jesus shares, how many of us thought we were the builder and the king? He's not talking about you. Who's the builder? Jesus. Who's the king? Jesus. He doesn't say for you to count the cost. He's calling disciples because he's building his church. Notice, he's going... Do you understand the work that's taking place here? I'm the builder who builds with precious stones and materials, and they're called my disciples. Do you think I'm the kind of builder that walks into it half ass and not knowing what I'm going to do and how many resources I have? Don't you think that I'm, I'm a God who's going to enter into a building project with people who are curious and not committed? He's building his church. And you know what that means? It means, number two, that the gates of hell will not stand against it. See, when God builds his church, there's going to be a battle that takes place, and that battle's against the enemy. And the battle with that enemy, he thinks he has the upper hand. Just like when Jesus was crucified, right? Everyone thought, oh, this is the end of that Messiah. When's the next Messiah going to roll through town, right? We crucified him, and then all of a sudden, he had the last word, right? Triumph over over sin, the, the grave, and death. And so... The king, he's the king. He's not saying you're the king. He's the king that now enters into battle. And he's the king that offers peace. 
But if you reject his peace, you will experience resistance. See, he's building the church and he's battling the enemy. And when you battle the enemy, how many of you can, can attest to this? He doesn't want you to be curious. He wants you to be committed because if you're curious and you try to battle the enemy, you're going to be destroyed. You go with the king who has assessed his people and always leads them in victory. The, the dynamic reason is that you're part of now his kingdom work. He's building his church. The church is not a building. It's the people, amen? And as we go through this world and we tr we're trying to bring more people to the, to the team, we realize there's a, there's a spiritual battle. The battle's raging, right? And, and he wants you to know that the relentless work of the enemy is intense, and when it comes to spiritual work, it's, it's even more intense, right? And he needs you to know that he can be trusted. We have a builder who will build, and his building will not fail, amen? We have a king who leads us in the battle, and he will never lose the battle, amen? And while he's building and while he's battling, guess what happens? He's making a better world. He's building a better world, and you know what that means. is if you're part of, part of God's family, if you're a committed disciple, you are salt in a world that has lost its flavor. You're in a world where there is a, there's a sense of there's no longer this, this sweet taste of God. And you, as God's disciples, are here because you're not just bringing flavor you're bringing a preservative. You're bringing a preserving agent. That as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, right, we walk about with the fragrance of Christ about us and that fragrance is either life to some, a sweet aroma, or it's death to others. But the fact is this, you have to maintain that fragrance and you can only be fragrant for Christ as you're walking with Christ. See, we live in a day where we don't understand the, 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 the qualities of salt, right? The salt that Jesus speaks of was salt that was, came along these salt marshes near the Dead Sea, and it was mingled with dirt, and it was mingled with the soil, and the more it got trampled on, the more it lost its effectiveness. And he's saying the true value of salt is when they went out there, when it was fresh, when it was, when it was crystallized and hadn't been trampled down into the, into the earth, and then it was able to be useful. Here's what Jesus is saying. When you follow him, you're useful, but when you don't follow him, you're useless. The world needs you. Believe it or not, the world needs you. And they don't need you to be curious. They need you to be committed. Because there's a craving for God that exists. God has set eternity in the hearts of people. And this world knows it needs something different than what it's being offered. We have Jesus. There's something different and there's something distinct. But you can't be different and distinct if you're not following him. You see, you see how serious this is? I'm, 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 was teary-eyed Friday when I got the report about Rabbi Zacharias, who one of my, one of the most influential people in my life as a, as a communicator, as an apologist, someone who would articulate the, the existence of God and, and, and defend Christianity. And here this, this report comes out about Rabbi Zacharias, who's, who died last year, two years ago. But all of a sudden now coming to the surface is this, these accounts of women that were abused, sexually abused by him. And you sit there, and, you're, and I was telling Lori over lunch on date day. So this was an exciting date day for us, as you can imagine. You know, and this is not the first time this has happened. There was, there was a mentor in my life who died a few years ago. A matter of fact, mentored my wife and I. He officiated our wedding. He died. And all of a sudden came to the surface that here was a man who deliver, deliberately silenced people who had been abused in his church. And now he's dead. And I'm sitting there going, I, I'd put him on a pedestal. I thought he was so distinct and different. And in reality, there was a secret life going on. And because of my mentor, because of Ravi Zacharias, the words from Nathan to David and Samuel are still true today. 
they've given now another occasion for the heathen to blaspheme our God. Ravi has stood before a holy God and a jealous God and he has faced God's judgment. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if I'll see Ravi in eternity. I hope I do. I hope it all wasn't just a game and a show. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But I'm reminded of, of people like Bill in my life and Ravi. God demands wholeheartedness, holiness, righteousness. I am terrified to be your pastor because I'm human. But you know what? I take my calling seriously. And I walk with a wife who's closer to me than you can ever imagine. And I have relationships with you that are, that are deeper than you can ever think of. The last thing I want to do is cause the heathen to blaspheme the name of my God. For you to read about my name in news in a negative light. There's a world that's dying and hurting without Jesus. And we have the opportunity to be involved in their lives. But they're not going to listen to you if you're not committed. They're not going to listen to you if you're not serious. Follow Christ to the end. Sacrifice whatever it means to love him and adore him and serve him. And I want to die with that song and that spirit and that, that, that drive because nothing else matters. Come into the light and let him expose all that selfishness and all that sinfulness and all that wickedness and taste and see that the Lord is good. Because there's nothing that he won't expose that he won't forgive and cleanse and, and then turn in a way to bring him glory and to seek to make the world a better place. Because not only does our God reign, but he forgives. And he loves like no, none other. And all God's people said, Amen. it's heavy. It's heavy, isn't it? It ought to be. It ought to be. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for allowing your people to be here today. And, and, and more than I pray that they're your people, I pray that you're, they're your disciples. I, I pray that we would all feel the weight of Jesus' words. I pray that we would all feel the weight, perhaps the sting of conviction because we know that conviction from you leads to consecration for you. And, and that's, that's what we pray. That's what I pray for myself. That we would not be nominal Christians, but that we would be committed followers. Because the cost of not doing that is higher. Please, Father, show us that there is no sacrifice too costly or painful, that ultimately won't be returned a hundredfold because the joy of following you is the greatest joy in the world. So move us toward that end. Work in us where we feel powerless. May your strength be perfected in our weakness and may, and may our song be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's our prayer, it's our cry. Lead us in that way that's everlasting. Thank you for life and love in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord <coughs> shine his face upon you. Show you his countenance that's full of beauty and grace and mercy and love and 
Know that he's with you every step of the way. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day.